best? Absolutely. Then the second one's going to break down the third. So any of these processes, the higher the number of prints, then you want the lowest number in the addition. Does that make sense? And with sculptures, they may only make seven before that mold breaks down. Then you know what they do? They have a mold breaking party and they break that mold so that no one else can recreate that sculpture, okay? Not that there aren't ways, but we're not talking about criminals today, right? We're not going there. So those are called additions, got it? All right, so it starts here. Now, this is Night, Death, and the Devil. Do you remember how last class I told you everything was about going to heaven or hell and it was all about sins, right? So you can imagine what that time was like. So here you got Albert Durer and I just look at the depth, look at the look at these images that he creates as if they're like demonic images here surrounding this person. And it was all and then what do you see here? There's his signature. So you see why I said the other one was most significant? He was making a statement. Here you have melancholia. Look at this movement and depth that he pulls you right there, doesn't it? Pulls you right through there. Also pulling you here and around and within. This is an amazing composition. But look at the tiny cross hatch that he does to create value. Nothing on these is shaded. This is completely what we call, it's this. The whole thing would be, this is called what? Uh, Pointillism uh, or stipple? Stipple, yeah. Yes. This hatching. Cross hatch. Okay? The whole thing is drawn that way. Have you ever tried doing one of those? What happens when you do a stipple or a pointillism? In the beginning, it looks really good, doesn't it? You have all this control, and visually you're spacing it out. Right? Look how good that looks. But after you do it for a while, what happens? It's spaced out, I guess. Because you're tired. Do you know how hard it is to do something and to keep your rhythm and to keep it going? How hard is it to dance all night? First time you're up on that dance floor, man, you can go to town. You're good. Second dance, third, you got your energy, you got your flow going. What happens at the end of the night? Sit down. Sit down. I can't do anymore, right? Same thing. Art is kinesthetic. It's rhythm, it's movement, it's not just being able to see, but it's physical. And after a while, I'm telling you, so when you see something like this, you can just, you can admire the workmanship even more. All right, this is his painting, Four Apostles. Now, look here. I love, this guy looks like he's floating back here. He almost looks like he doesn't have body, doesn't he? Okay, so that very dark, fading to that dark, do you remember what that's called? That was the tenebrism. Tenebrism. And that, does that create a more dramatic effect than you blacken out the background? Yes, because we go from light to dark, so it gives us a major depth of space. But, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but whenever I look at this painting, he's the first thing I see. It's like the floating head back there. And it's a little, a little creepy. I'm not going to lie to you. I think it's a little creepy. It's a little weird, right? All right. Now. Lucas Cranach the Elder, Law and Gospel. Wow. Look at all of this going on. Do you like this guy running and he's getting feared? The stories are the same over and over again. It's about the good and the evil, is it not? Wait, now we have nude women again. Outdoors. Why are the men in clothes and the women not? That would be a great dissertation for somebody. Truthfully. That'd be a great project answer that. That would be good. Here we have Hans Bolden, the Witch's Sabbath. And really, y'all, some of these, if you get up close to them, they're almost comical. Three Ages of Women and Death. Look at this. You 
You see that? So that's telling you the time, right? The different stages. The first is looking in the mirror. What is that telling you? Young, look at the long hair. Beautiful, the vanity. Then what happens? And Jane. then, here we have Battle of Issus. Now, y'all aren't in Art History 1, but the Battle of Issus was Alexander the Great, and the Greeks always fought, always, just about with the Persians, okay? So the Battle of Issus was huge because it was one that they won, finally. And so now you see this story going on about that. And here's one of my favorites. Hans Holbein the Younger. Now I told you about illusion, right? What's in the bottom of this painting? Uh, somebody holding the, uh, the uh, palette as a paint. I, I mean, I, like I'm assuming, like from here, like I'm, like it seems like that's what you think, right? Yeah. Do you know what it is, Kevin? It's a skull. A skull. It's a skull. Oh wow. Okay, so this is an optical illusion. Yeah. So this painting was painted to go in a castle as you went down the stairs. So you know how you'll have a staircase and then you have um, a landing and then it'll turn and you go another direction. That's what this was painted for. So as you're walking down the stairs, what does the skull look like to you? Like an actual skull? Yes, and as you pivot. It like looks like it's like kind of like turning its head. And yes, is that optical illusion? Yeah. And when we see it painted this way, and what it takes to do that, you can't even tell that's what it is, right? So you have to experience it to know, but imagine what that did to people, their minds, right? I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I would have wanted to go to that castle if I'd heard about that painting. I'd be like, oh, I got to see this. I, gotta, I, I know just Mona Lisa's eyes following me. I can't tell you how many times I've walked back and forth. Mona Lisa, right? But yeah, it's the optical illusions. Now, how did artists figure this out? Most of them threw the camera obscura, to be honest. That is a lot of, of how they came up with this. And this is a lot of how they started to understand the illusion. But do you see how in this time period they're learning tricks? Okay, what's important about that is people, those tricks are being used every day to day. What do you think advertising does? And it works. I've always wanted to have a strong enough skill in art and know it well enough that I could be the one to create the artwork and manipulate and do that, I don't feel like I've ever gotten there, but I would love to know all of the tricks of doing this. And I know many artists that do, they said that they've spent a lifetime trying to learn just that alone, how to do that. There aren't any set rules on how to do it, by the way. There aren't. I mean, you just, you kind of have to play with mirrors and light and work it. But it's also about, look, remember I told you the time period, 1533. Don't you think it was huge that the Americas had been discovered? Don't you think that was a huge impact back in Europe? Do you know how many artists came here because they heard about the beauty? And so they went, you know, they would, they would travel through, um, gosh, like, oh my God, it's pouring down. They would travel through um, areas like Yellowstone, the Sierra Nevada, those landscapes, Colorado. Imagine that. Now, if you've been through the countryside of Europe and all of Europe, it was pretty amazing that they were seeing these gorgeous places. So what they would do is they would paint on these um, small paintings that were kind of like cloth paintings that later on become postcards for us. We do postcards, right? And used to postcards were all about travel. You didn't have a photograph of where you were. You sent a postcard. I'm at Disneyland. Let me send postcards back to all my family so they all know that I'm at Disneyland, okay? Same idea, but they had these paintings and then with press they were reproducing those and those were being sent back. So it was kind of the beginning of that, but many of these in the beginning were just artists painting 
these things and then it was sent back to Europe. Well, the more the Europeans started to see the landscape and what was in Europe, the more they started demanding that supply and demand, I guess is a good way of putting it. So artists in this country started painting what? Landscapes, all of them. Gorgeous landscapes. How many people do you think were born in the United States because of that? A lot. Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't know about y'all when you travel, but 90%, no, I wouldn't say that because a lot of mine is research, but for me, 50%, I would say most people, about 90% of the reason they choose to go somewhere is because they've seen an image of it. I want to go to Hawaii, that's gorgeous, right? I want to go to, um, I don't know, Venice, isn't that beautiful? You know what I mean? It's because you see a picture of it more than anything. So think of it that way. All right, not only that, they're playing out how intellectual, how we've grown. Look at this wonderful fabric. Look at this ability to paint fur here. Look at each one of these images telling you, look, here's that camera obscura. Here's a world glow. Here's a musical instrument. Here's a book. What are they telling you? What time period is it? It's the great time period of the world in discovery, is it not? And imagine how that's changing the world. How much do you think the internet changed our world? That, that's what it was like for them, basically, at that time. So here you have um, Henry VIII. What do you know about Henry VIII? He started the Anglican Church. Mm-hmm. And he Something about sons. His son, like, he was trying to have a son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had, like, six wives. Yes, he did. Why? Because he wanted a male heir. Did he ever get one? Yeah, but he died really quickly. Yeah. So he never had one. So who becomes the heir? Mary and then Elizabeth. It should have gone to Mary. Well, it was Mary and then Elizabeth, but yeah. But it didn't go to Mary. It went to Elizabeth. Well, it went Elizabeth to has Mary executed. No, Mary dies naturally. Are you talking Mary, Queen of Scots? No, Bloody Mary. Okay. Mary Queen of Scots really should have had the throne. Oh. And she's cousin to cousin. Elizabeth. And Elizabeth gets the throne. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. See, and truthfully, rightfully, it probably should have gone to her. But Henry VIII had wives beheaded, literally executed. He couldn't have a male heir. Yes, he did start the Anglican Church. Why? Because the Pope wanted an old marriage. Exactly, exactly. So then Elizabeth, when she becomes queen, what does she do? Uh, she kind of like <clears throat> takes the Anglican church that Henry had created and kind of like, like he, she like makes like liturgy for it and like makes it kind of like Protestant theology, but like Catholic. Exactly, and she marries England. Yeah. She marries England. And revises it, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Powerful woman. Very powerful. Powerful rank. But now we're talking about who's in control. It's the royals. And so the royals have taken basically the control, what was the church. And the church used to be the council. And the control. But Henry VIII, like you said, he pulled away. Okay. So Elizabeth is listening to, to the council. And she decides that she will marry. She'll marry England. She paints her face white. Have you seen those images? She paints her face white and she marries the church. 